morning. Okay, let me try that for a um, while. Good morning. Good. Again, it is uh, a great joy and a great honor to be here to participate in this 2021 Lagos Bible Conference. And not just to participate, but to speak and to bring the word of God to us. I want, on behalf of uh, our local assembly uh, in Abuja, thank the organizer, particularly our brothers and sisters at uh, Serving Grace Bible Church and their first love. Thank you for uh, having us come. They send their greetings, and I think uh, our members should be joining live in the course of this meeting also to participate. Uh, and to see Brother DJ. Good morning, sir. <laughs> you made it. The job that, or the assignment that I've been given to me this morning is to define what is God's sovereignty. Uh, so I will ask that we turn to some scriptures, then I'll get right into the job. Uh, my main text is from Psalm 115, 115. Verse 3, uh, but I'll be reading from verse 1 to 8 and verse 16. Then I'll read from Romans chapter 11, verse 33 to 36, but my, my text, the text that I'll be teaching from is verse 3 of Psalm 115 and verse 3 only. But just to, uh, for the sake of context, I will read those two passages and then I'll go back to Psalm 115. Psalm 115 from verse 1 to 8. Not unto us, O Lord, not to us, Sorry, I'm reading from ESV, okay? English Standard Version. So, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, why should the nations say, or uh, if you are reading King James, I think it uses the word heathen. Why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak, eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear, noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel, feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throats. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Verse 16. The heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of man. Please turn quickly with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11 verse 33 and I'll read up to verse 36 
And then we all go back to Psalm 115. Romans 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. So let's return back to Psalm 115 and keep your Bible open before you and make sure that I preach only from that text. So in case I begin to preach from something else, you can raise your hand and say, Pastor, get back to the scripture. Get back to the scripture because it is the scripture that forms uh, the ground for our discussion this morning. The scripture, the, we believe in the authority, the finality, the inspiration, and the inerrancy of the scriptures. It is on the ground of the scripture that we are here today. And I believe it to do you good to listen to the voice of God from the scripture than from my mind, my philosophy, my worldview, uh, no matter how good they may look like, would do you no good. Uh, the scripture is sufficient for you, is good for you. Uh, so this morning, the Lord will be speaking to us from the text of the scripture, the breath out word of God. But let me pray with us as I begin to teach. Immortal, invisible God, only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from my eyes, most gracious, most excellent, most wonderful, most supreme, most sovereign God, we worship you. We bow before you today. We've looked upon your face in your son. And we have been saved. And now, oh God, as we have come this morning, let the entrance of this word bring understanding. Let it bring genuine repentance. Let it bring clarity to our mind. Let the saints be strengthened. Let sinners come to salvation. And I pray, O oh God, that you will deliver us from distractions of any kind, that we may be here listening to you and what you will say to your church this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I hope you can hear me clearly. There are some echo uh, that I can hear from here, but you, uh, you manage uh, the sound. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's manageable. I think we can do much with the sound. So l let me reiterate my assignment. My assignment is to speak or to define what God's sovereignty is. The theme of this conference is to look at suffering and the sovereignty of God. But before we get into the, 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 the depth of the discussions around uh, suffering and sovereignty, it is important that we understand uh, what God's sovereignty is and what is not. So why is it important that we should define God's sovereignty? 
In the first place, my brothers and my sisters, we live in the world today that does not really bother about definitions, particularly the world of Christians, and particularly the world of Christians in Africa, and particularly the world of Christians in Nigeria. We don't really want to know the meaning of anything as long as it's, I mean, God is speaking to me, it's fine. Okay, let's let just, let's just, we should not bother ourselves with specific meanings of things. And I think the organizers of this conference are doing us a favor. And I think you should do yourself a favor when you get back to your own context to have the capacity to ask questions as to what is the why and the what of terms. So if your pastor is using some terms that you don't understand, it is wisdom, it is Christian wisdom and prudence to ask, what is it? Because all of us can say, ah, we believe in God. So we believe in God's sovereignty. We, we can say that and mean something differently. Uh, I want to really calm down because I'm defining this thing. Okay? I don't want to like shout. Okay? If I'm shouting, say, do I say, okay, go. We need to be on the same page. We need to be the people of God or the people that are speaking with one voice regarding this. If not, even the Muslim will agree mentally with you that God is sovereign. Even, um, even the pagan, the African traditional religionist who, who believe that God is sovereign. So we, we want to be sure that we will give a Christian definition to these uh, terms so that we are on the same page. Is that a good idea? Good idea, yes. As a young person growing up in a church, God's, God's sovereignty as a term, as a theological term, is not something that is preached or Thoughts in my own context regularly. And some of you can agree with me that it's not something that was given serious attention to in most of our context. Uh, but as, as I was studying from this, uh, A.W. Pink, A.W. Pink uh, wrote a book called The Sovereignty of God, and I commend that book to you. Uh, A.W. Pink, pink as in pinky, pink. Yeah, so look for that book. Uh, it, 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 you, he said that the understanding of the doctrine or the doctrine of the sovereignty of God is the key to history. God's sovereignty, the understanding of it, he says, is the interpreter of providence. Providence is God. Uh, sovereign superintendence over creation. He is the interpreter of providence. And he said, is the warp and woof of scripture and the foundation of Christian theology. So everything rises and falls on understanding of God's sovereignty. How we will behave in church and in our life rests on this. So there are about three things I want to observe with us from verse 3 of the book of Psalm 115. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. So three things we are, we are going to look at is who is God? And the second thing is where is he? And the third thing is, what can he do? What does he do? There's one funny sticker on, uh, that lawyers, I think some lawyers do put at the back of their car and say, within lawyers, they do self. How I many of you have seen that sticker before? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Within lawyers, they do self. So the third question will look at within God. If, if this God is the God that you have defined, within in the do. Okay. So let's get back to my first point, the identity of our God. Who is he? If you look at Psalm 115, 
it's, it's like the, the, the nations, the unbelievers are asking, who, who is your God? No, what is the identity of your God? And you can see that in verse 2. Why should the nation say, where is their God? And the word there, there, referring to the covenant community of God as represented in, uh, in Israel. The Jewish people are God's people. They are God's covenant community at this time. And other nations surrounding them are asking, who is your God? Or where is he? And the psalmist uh, gave an answer to that. He said, our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. I hope if I remove my jacket, that will not be out of place. Thank you, guys. So who is God? But before I answer the question of who is God, let me answer, uh, let me give an answer to who God is not. There are errors and outright heresy about God over time. Let me start from home. Uh, the, the, the Africans, uh, in our African traditional religion, what they call ATR, does have a conception of God. And our idea of God is that it is almighty somewhere in the middle of other gods. It's like there are many gods and he is on top of the pile. And all of them are gods. It's just that he is of a higher rank than the rest. The technical word for that is polytheism. You believe in many gods. The gods of your forefathers are gods. Uh, Amadi Oha is a god. Shango is a god. Mm, other gods, you know the names. Uh, they are gods. They are all valid. They are all uh, gods. And then the, the transcendent almighty God is also God. They are all doing different assignments uh, at one point. Perhaps the, our idea is that the almighty God created maybe everything. Then he now share in, in, in company of other gods. And then he share responsibility. Like now we are in this hall. Joel is working there. The other person is working there. The other person is working there. They are all working together. They are all friends. They are no enemies. And then all those gods are, are routes to the divine. That is our African traditional religion worldview. The Bible talks about that as being wrong. It is not a white man idea that they are trying to put down African tradition uh, religion, no. It is a biblical idea that uh, polytheism, multiplicity of gods, are no gods at all. They are wrong, they are sinful, and the Bible calls those who believe in those things to turn back to the one and only living God. Ah, uh, there are in in, in in the West, America particularly and Europe also have come up with the idea of a God in their in their theological theological concept of open theism. They believe that this God in heaven who is open, who does not really know everything, and it's not uh, he, he is God, yes, he's sovereign. But within his sovereignty, he, there are some limitations that he, he placed upon himself regarding knowledge. And I think open theism is the modern version of Arminianism. Uh, okay, since this is not a theological school, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I was comfortable in, in Abuja because we were teaching students, so I was able to use some terms. That, but um, uh, Arminianism, uh, short, sh in short, is that is the idea that God is in charge of this, of that, of that, but in the salvation of man, God is not sovereign. 
I think Arminianism deny election and predestination to a large extent. And the church denounced Arminianism as error, as heresy. So this is, that is the God of some, uh, of some people, the God that is open, the God that is open to surprises. <laughs> now there's another God. Uh, these are within the framework of the church. This particular one, uh, the, the, uh, back, back in the days, I think it should be the second or third century uh, heresy called Manichaeism. Uh, is the idea that there are two equal power uh, eternally. That there is a God that is all powerful, is the good one. That there is another one that is equally powerful and capable and valid, is the bad one. S let me just, in the, in the simple way, they are saying that both Sat Satan and God are both gods uh, that have existed from 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 eternity and both does have equal power the word for that is dualism it means there are two entities that controls the affairs of this world sometimes one will win one will lose like chelsea and uh, chelsea and uh, so. even in church you still remember the name of your clubs eh? should have dropped them by the gate hmm? So sometimes this good God will win. And then sometimes this bad one will kind of over, outmaneuver the good one and twist him. And then, and then uh, if you want to read much about that, Google or ask some theologians. It's, it's, a, it's a way. Because the reason why I'm giving this definition is that nothing is new. Most of the errors that we have in our days have been in existence way back it's just that they are here in a different garment and we must probe deeper to understand them so god is not in company the god that the psalmist referred to as our god is not in company of other gods uh it's not the god that uh, have an equal somewhere where which the boats uh, uh kurul is God. And the psalmist said, our God. And in that word, we can uh, uh, pull out the identity of this God. If you understand a little bit of Hebrew, the word God as given in the English there is called Elohim. And Elohim is, 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 is plural. It is God's. And, and this points to the identity of the God of the Bible as I forgot to mention Islam. Okay. Uh, the God of the Islam is called Allah. So Allah is not the God of the Bible. And I, I, they are in that same category of, of, the, of the other one. And they are, they are gods. Here, we are talking about our God. And the Bible calls him Elohim. And as far back as the book of uh, Genesis chapter 1, where he now said, let us make man in our own image. Uh, there is uh, a hint with a bang about the nature of this God. And we understand that this God is, is one, both in three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this three is one. There are no three gods. There are no three emanations. There are, there are three persons in one Godhead. And since I'm not here to teach about Trinity, I'm just saying this by way of mentioning that the God of the Bible is triune. Is triune. It's not, um, it's not Allah who is alone and detached from uh, the world that he creates it. The God of the Bible is unique in the sense that he stands in the class of his own and we... He, he revealed himself to us in two ways. One way was through the general revelation that when we look at the, the vegetations and the beauty, the mountains and all the things that he has created, we could, we could reason correctly that there is a God somewhere. But natural and general revelation is not sufficient to bring us to a clear understanding of the God of the Bible due to special revelation. 
Special revelations are the revelations as given by the scriptures. So God called Israel into a covenant relationship with them and he gave them his law. Uh, Psalm 147 verse 19 says, God has not dealt with any nation in that fashion. It's, they were unique people and God revealed himself to them as a triune God. This God is unique. In 1689, Second London Baptist Confession of Faith that will be given to you tomorrow, uh, their definition of this God is like this. It said, the Lord our God is but one only living and true God whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, who only have immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, every way infinite, most holy, most wise, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his immutable and most righteous will for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgressions, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, withal most just and terrible in his judgment, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the good thing. Which God can be who, like this God? If you place this definition on Shango, Shango will disappear. Any gods, any gods will fizzle out into insignificance if you place these terms on their, on their little head. Is this God is, is our God? He's transcendent, unique, different, separated from sinners. But much more than that is that this God is relational. Look at how the psalm is put. He's our God. So personal that the covenant community could call him their God. Like you say, my husband, my wife, my children. This God is so big, so transcendent, so immense, but is also relational. There is no God like that. How many of you have passed through serious shrine before? Uh, what is it? I say you passed through. I, I didn't say if you have visited the shrine so that you not feel as if I'm talking. <laughs> you just walk up as. Uh, a serious shrine, because there are some useless shrines around Africa for women and children. There are some, but there are some serious, like Okija. Yes, yes, yes like Okija. How many of you, even as Christians, want to go there for tourism? Say, I want to go and see Okija and see how the head of the gods look like. No. Those gods are impersonal. They don't relate. That is the idea. So when the nations say, where is your God? Who is your God? This is the definition. He is like no other. And outside divine revelation, there is no way a natural fallen man can conceive the idea of a triune God. He's bigger than your brain. He's immense. He's invisible. Without body parts, pure spirit, the confession says. Amen. So the second question is, where is the God? Verse 2. Look at the psalmist in the face and said, Who is your God? Where is your God? And to that, the psalmist replied, Our God, our God is in the heavens. Now, let me ask you, where is heaven? Where is heaven? You can answer that one. Where is heaven? 
In terms of geography now, where is heaven? We are doing like this, eh? But we've been told that this world is like a ball and is rotating like this. So where is, okay. Yeah, for us, up is here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the idea of God being in heaven should not kind of make us think that if you take some rocket some, and then you begin to go towards the trajectory of, of this, and then it should travel for like one trillion years, then we'll, you are, finally, finally, you will arrive. And then the gate of heaven will be open. There are 24 elders with white beards. Then there are some lions there. There are some giraffe. And then the, the gate, you see Angel Michael, then Angel Gabriel. And then there will be the throne of God down there. And then Jesus is on the right hand with the seat. And then, and then you say, wow. Actually, some of, your, some of the jokers around our, 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 our locales, we will release video that, that say, I died, I went to heaven, eh? And then after they went to heaven, they have a tour of heaven. They even saw the throne of God. They saw Jesus. They saw some angels. And then they will go round and round and round, and then they will go to hell again. Then in hell, the door will be open. Then there will be this Satan with two horns, with a tail. And then Satan is a superintendent, is the pastor of hell. And then the Satan will take them and say, look at that was Pastor Ojuku down there. He used to preach and insult me. I have him now. Oh, that, the other sister that died the other time, actually he lied in the morning and on, his, on her way to work, she died. So that, that is the, And people... Oh. That's what goes in your mind. Well, let me just digress. Let me just put that for Satan is not the superintendent of hell, okay? Uh -huh. It's not that Satan is in hell governing... The space. If you want to know who is the ogre of hell, ask uh, Joel or Pastor Tony later. Okay, but, but I've just told you now, Satan is not in charge of hell. As to, because every ghost there is does have location, isn't it? Shango, where am I? I'm in the West. Shango is not all over the place, okay? There's a place where if there's a god called Shango, it's somewhere maybe in Ibado. So if you go to Ibado, that's where the gods is. All the other gods are territorial. They have location. They have, they, they, they have people. The Shango is the god of the Yoruba, can never be the god of the Igbo. Never. It will not work. So each, each community, each ethnicity does have their own gods and he can act within this within his own space if you carry shango to kazare in, in uh, jigawa he will be say he, he, he don't even understand how sir he has to learn he, he will be say okay waiting what are you guys doing here eh? and like that so they ask where is your god we, we know of Molek. Molek is of the Sidonian. We know of Baal. We know they have temples. They have everything. But this is your God. Where is he? And the psalm is just our God is in the heavens. What that means is that our God, <laughs> if Solomon said, even the heavens cannot contain God, how much more this little temple? Our God is, is, in containable, a, a God that can be pinned down to a location cannot be the God of the Bible that created the entire universe. It's in the heavens. And again, I'm not trying to stretch this to, too far and dive into the error of pantheism. Because pantheism is saying, God is God, but everything also is God. God is in everything. God is in the camera, is in the chair, is in the flowers, is in the animals. That is pantheism. That is not what I'm saying. This God is 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 is, is, is so transcendent. Is everywhere. Is in the heavens. Is in in the most exalted position. Is in the heavens. Because as, 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 according to the confession, it does not have body parts. 
So when we talk of God's hands, God's feet, it, it is just a human language to communicate some attributes of God. This God cannot be explained and cannot be pinned down to a location. Church, am I confusing you? This is the God of the Bible. It's unique. It's not like any other gods that we've been told. So where is our God? It's in the heaven. If I were David, I would answer like, are you sure you really want to know where God is? Alcides Proud talks about, I mean, his favorite scripture is where? Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6, the holiness of God. If you know God, if you know God, you, 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 will. you know, sometimes people say, yeah. you know, recently I was talking to a, a lady who wants to step out of her marriage, and I said, see, let's look at what God say about this matter. He said, Pastor, let's, let's, let's leave God out of this matter. Hmm? And straight away I know she has, she has never met God. Now, many of you have met, have seen lions in the zoo before. But you've not met, met lions in the wild. Have you? Somebody wanted to give me a ride. They say I can walk uh, a cheetah. What a cheetah is like a sister to what? Uh, what's the other wild animal? There's lion. There's a cheetah. What is the other one? Leopard. No. Tiger. Yes, a tiger. That I can walk the tiger for five minutes for two hundred dollars. So you pay two hundred dollars to the guys in the safaris, and then they will allow you. Some five minutes with the tiger and walk the tiger for five minutes. So as I was trying to make up my mind, to, it's, it's free, two hundred dollars. I I changed it to naira. I changed it. I said two hundred dollars to naira is is this. As of today, that's about uh, almost hundred thousand to risk my life. And uh, then I said, by the way, before you start, let me t let, that if the animal began to do you like this. Begin to do like this. Don't resist. It's okay. Leave, leave the matter. Take the, leave the matter. Because if you know God, you will fear him. You won't even ask who is God. A fool say in his heart, there is no God. Let me rush to my concluding points. As to say, what does he do? That is the main point of this discussion about the God's sovereignty. They are saying, who is God? Our God is transcendent. Where is he? He's in the heaven. What can he do? I will enter into this discussion very quickly by saying, our God is not defined by what he does or what he does not do. Okay, let, me, let, me, let, me, uh, let me calm down with that. Other gods are known by their actions. The God of thunder is known by his ability to use thunder for evil or for good. The gods of fertility are known for giving answer to the questions of fertility in their region of control. The god of, uh, mm, the god of money <laughs> used to give people money if you sacrifice good sacrifice to him. So gods are known by what they do. I can give an example. Remember in the days of uh, Eli, Eli, there was a war between Israel and the, who? The Philistines. Then the war was terrible, was tough. So the children of Eli and the commanders of the army went and brought the ark. Because at the point, at this point in the life of Israel, uh, where they become so fallen into iniquity, the, the reason in their mind that their God is in the ark. So if they bring the ark to the war front, the ark can turn the battle around. And the Philistines too understand that. So when they saw the ark, the Bible said the Philistines began to cry. They said, oh, we don't finish. Because this, this, this God, this God now uh, is terrible. But as the Bible tells us, 
God was, God was captured. Hmm? The ark was captured. And the ark was taken away. And the heathens began to jubilate. Finally, we have Jehovah in our custody. So what can he do now? He has been defeated. He is not able to win war. So the, the, the idea is that if God can do X, Y, Z, then he is God. Then if he cannot do this and this for me, he is not God. Uh, okay. Are you hearing me? So if God can give me a job, pay my bills, if this God can fix my health, then he is God. Mm -hmm. Then if he's not fixing my bill, if this God cannot stop me, cannot produce husband for me, if this God cannot produce money in my pocket, if this God cannot procure visa to Canada or America for me, therefore, I put a question mark on his head. And what I'm saying is that our God is not defined by what he does. Action, action does not really define him. Whether he does something or not, he remains God. That's what I'm trying to communicate. Is that clear up to this point? That whether he acts or he did not act, whatever happens, he is in the class of his own. Because the entire universe, including you, your ministry, your passion, your dream, are not necessary. The creation of this world is not necessary. We are never necessary. It was at the pleasure of God that he brings creation to being. It's not that myself and Pastor Tony went to heaven and said, God, you know, you need, you need an earth. You've been lonely. Eh? You and these angels run around. You see, even Lucifer has been disappointing you. Why don't you create something else that can, that can make you feel good? A.W. Pink, again, define God's sovereignty in this way. I'm almost closing. The sovereignty of God. And he said, what do we mean by this expression? And he says, we mean the supremacy of God, the kingship of God, the godhood of God. And to say that God is sovereign is to declare that God is God. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the most high, doing according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, so that none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Daniel chapter 4 verse 35. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the almighty, the possessor of all power in heaven and earth so that none can defeat his counsel, thwart his purpose, or resist his will. Psalm 115 verse 3. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the governor among nations. Psalm 22 verse 28. Setting up kingdoms, overthrowing empires, and determining the course of dynasties as he pleases in base. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the only potentate, the king of kings, the lord of lords. Such is the God of the Bible. Amen. He continues, the sovereignty, uh, sovereignty characterizes the whole being of God. He is sovereign in all his attributes. He is sovereign in the exercise of his power. His power is exercised as he wills, when he wills, where he wills and how he wills it. That is the nature of our God. For God to be sovereign, we are saying that God has unlimited, unqualified power to do whatever he wants to do anywhere, everywhere, anyhow, anytime. Including here in Nigeria, including anywhere. And there is nowhere in the universe where God is not in control. That's what we are saying. So God is in control when you are down with cancer. God remains on the throne. God remains on the throne when Adam and Eve fell. As I'm closing, do you, do you remember that when Adam fell, you know, 
I, I used to, in my Sunday school, in my own format, in my ch childhood, how many minutes? Do you, you have to be showing me like they used to do in Abuja. So I'm already closing. See, we used to learn in our Sunday school that the day Lucifer wanted to overthrow God. That is the story. So God was sitting on the throne. The Lucifer was having a meeting at the back of the curtain. Said, okay, let's, let's get this guy down. Let's get this guy down. And then Lucifer was approaching the throne. And God is still sitting down there trying to figure out what to do. Then Michael now say, are we going to allow this guy to run, run our father down? And then Michael and the angels come together, and then there was a battle in heaven. Remember, that started trying to redact Revelation chapter 12. So there was fighting. Oh, like, you know, then this one threw a bomb, another one threw a bomb, and there was chaos in heaven. And finally, finally, Angel Michael won. And that's why in some churches, Angel Michael is very important, eh? Very, very important. People will be jumping, Angel Michael, where are you? Angel Michael, if not, if not for Angel Michael that day, what would have happened to God? Have you ever asked, what happened? Assuming Angel Michael did not just jump into action, taking the bull by the horn. By now, God will have been, oh, God will have been dead. And this, this, I think, who wrote this book, God is Dead? Uh, is this Charles Dawkins? Eh? Is this Charles Dawkins? Who is that? Yes. God is dead. But you know what? As, as I read the scripture, I discover that there's no way Satan will have done anything. <laughs> and when it comes to God, I'm not sure Lucifer could have done anything. anything. Even his actions, the way he destroyed the Garden of Eden, are still within the circumference of the sovereignty of God. If they were not for the glory of God, he wouldn't have allowed it to happen. If it, <laughs> and much more than what the confession teaches is that it's not that God just knew that Lucifer is going to do something. He foreknew it, okay, oh yeah, Lucifer is going to fight next week, I have an idea. No. God knew all that will happen, but much more than that, he ordains it. Whatever God knows, he ordains. Yet, he is not the author of sin. Uh, the details, the rest of the brothers will be fleshing them out. Ask them questions, okay? As I close to the John Murray, or John Murray, Murray, that is M-U-R-R-A-Y, you know, all these white people, they, they just caught his by. That's where my point is. He said the examination, uh, John, I think John Murray wrote a book, what is not... Uh, uh, okay, I forgot the name of the book now. An examination of this witness will show that it is not mere uniqueness or supremacy or even transcendence in the realm of deity. It is not as if there were a host of lesser deities over whom God is supreme and therefore demands from us supreme worship and devotion. It is rather that he alone is God. The Lord, he is God. There is none else beside, quoting scripture now. And, he, he, and, 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 he, and what he's saying is it. When we say God is sovereign, we are not even saying God is sovereign. And then there are other lesser, lesser gods here in Africa, in Ghana, in Pretoria, and all over places that God is bigger than. A right conception of God and God's sovereignty Require us to come away with understanding that apart from this our God, there is no any other God anywhere. And this is the point you are going to stone me. Are you saying the gods you know in your villages are no gods? It's just that we call them gods for want of words to use. The reason why we even give them, we, we call if this, is, if this is some gods now, it's okay, this is gods. We use small g and, 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 and in plural. What John Murray is saying is, apart from Jehovah, there is no any other gods anywhere. We call those small, small gods gods because we don't, have any, we don't know what to, we don't want to, no, don't want to call them again. Eh? It's like, it's like, 
how do you call bandits? You don't, we don't know what to call them again. If not, we know the name. It's, we know they are, they, there is no God apart from God, the God of the Bible. And it is to him your loyalty belongs. It is to him your faith belongs. The Bible says no one has ever seen God except the one that came down from heaven. And in God's sovereignty and love, he sent his son to the earth in human flesh. The Bible says, Galatians 4 verse 4, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. His son, who is the, who is the express image of himself. And people beheld him in flesh and blood. And he came here, paid the penalty for sin, and then went back to the Father. So those who are in him will be called God's children. So we can call him our God today because we are in him. And this will help us in our worship. This will help us in our understanding of the troubles around us. So when you are, when you are bullied by some of you now cannot even go to your villages because you believe there's one God in your villages. They call them um, gener family generational causes. They also call them family stronghold. You know, some of you take prayer people to the village to go and dig out some gods that are troubling you. Eh? Some ge territorial demons. You know, in those days, we go for evangelism. We come to look with you. They say for the next one month, we'll be praying, trying to take over this territory. All the territorial demons, all the territorial mummy water spirits. I mean, we have mummy water. There is no God. There is absolutely no God except the God of the Bible. And this God is our God forever and ever. And he will be our God even now, even to the end of the age. Father, bless your people and grant more understanding as the day goes by today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much.